Everyone can see this is Barack Obama, and at one of his campaign speeches, he made a very common speech about how um, black fathers need to step up, and there's too many black absent fathers, and it's very common. Lots of people have um, made speeches about this and also criticized speeches about this, but no one ever really answered the question of where. And there's nearly three million more black women in communities and in urban areas like cities, there's a gender gap of 37% for blacks. And there's a million black men in prisons and the media is just blind to it. That's that's the where, there's a million black men in prison. And it's partially due or mainly due to the war on drugs because um, everyone's heard of the war on drugs, but you might be oblivious to the fact that it's still going on and that's uh, a main cause and why there's so many missing in quotes quote unquote missing black men because um there's a million in prison and a lot of their charges are for mild or some severe but some mild uh drug charges so um there's more black adults under correctional control today than enslaved Africans were in 1850. And a black child born today is less likely to have both parents and a black child born during slavery, slavery simply because there's so many black men in prisons uh, due to drug charges. And once criminal, always a criminal. Once um, something, once you go to jail for something, it stays on your criminal record and it basically um, perfectly legalizes discrimination because it's based on criminal records. So it just makes it that much harder to get a job, get a house, etc. And it's just become so normalized now that we are like almost oblivious to it. So Stanley Cohen uh, wrote this book, States of Denial, and basically explains how we see what we want to see and we're blind to everything else, not only to racism, but it also explains like genocide, stuff like that. Um, we're just in denial. So we see pictures plastered all over the news every night of people doing awful things and going to jail for them, but we don't ever really think about it. Just kind of look, maybe we'll have a thought here and there saying like, oh, I'm so glad this person is getting locked up. That was such an awful thing to do. Um, we know there's a lot of people going into jail, but we don't really know. We never really see pictures of people, usually black men who are have a mild drug charge and they're in prison. We don't really see that. So we know it's a possibility, but it's kind of just in the back of our minds. We don't really necessarily think about it 24 seven. Um, what we think of racism is widely different than the aspects embedded into US society today, just because we think of racism, we think of lynchings and mobbings and stuff like that. And, but in reality, a big part of racism today is um, black men being thrown into prison for uh, mild drug charges and stuff like that. And also the discrimination that follows being a criminal. Um, mass incarceration is easier to ignore than times of Jim Crow laws. We like see it on TV every day, but we also change channel every day. And Marianne Young made this analogy to, to um, discrimination and um, denial of racism today and basically they said that uh, if you examine only one wire of like a bird cage uh, it's hard to understand why the bird's trapped but you have to look and understand that all the wires collectively together are keeping that bird trapped in so one wire might be you know prison inequality another might be housing inequality another might be struggling to find a house after being in prison etc and sexual and uh Birdhouses also have a door, so it's easy for some people to say like, oh, there's an open door. These people don't have to go down this path. But we also have to understand the structure of the cage that they're living in and that they grew up in and how that plays a role. For how it works for the new Jim Crow, the mass incarceration is an issue that will never be addressed until we step back and view the problem as a whole. And it's a system that works to keep African Americans away from the white society and put them into cages and jails. And the war on drugs is a global campaign that is used to reduce illegal drug trade in the United States. And it has led to an extraordinary number of black men being arrested and put into jails and prisons. So there are three stages of entrapment. The first stage is roundup, which is when police conduct drug operations 
to find drugs in communities and arrest the people that are dealing the drugs. So these police tend to target poor communities with people of color and sweep them into the criminal justice system. Police are allowed to rely on race as a factor when selecting people to stop and search, so they are not getting in trouble for just stopping black people or just stopping white people or just stopping any minority based on their race to conduct a search. And people of color are more likely to be caught for drug-related offenses compared to white people since more people of color are being searched. So police are just keeping an eye on people of color and targeting them to find drugs so they aren't seeing all the white people that are also committing the crime. The second stage is the period of formal control, which is more of the legal stance in the criminal justice system, which... Defendants are usually denied a relevant legal representation, so they cannot always afford good defense attorneys, and they are often led with public defenders to defend them in the court, and they are most likely pressured to plead guilty because it is, whether they're guilty or not, it's hard for them to prove their innocence in the crime, in the court that is created by the white man and puts the black people in jail. So prosecutors are allowed to load up defendants with extra charges, and police are allowed to assume that where there are drugs, there are guns. So this is extremely easy for prosecutors to load up on gun charges um, when they are looking for drugs. So the war on drugs led to harsher sentencing for crimes to scare drug dealers. So if a drug dealer sees that their friend got caught and is facing life in prison, then that drug dealer may stop because they do not want to face that charge. And drug offenders in the United States spend more time in jails, prisons, and on parole and probation compared to any other country. The third stage of entrapment is invisible punishment, which is life after being released. So there are sanctions imposed to ensure that the majority of convicted offenders will not integrate into the white society. Ex-prisoners are given nearly nothing once they are released, and in the article it says that prisoners released in Illinois are given as little as $10 and a bus ticket anywhere in the United States. So they are stripped away from their rights once they are released from prison, and they struggle to find employment, housing, education, and public benefits because it's hard for somebody with a uh, criminal record to find a job since the employers are looking at your record and seeing like, oh, you committed this crime, I don't want you working at my company. So prisoner re-entry is another big issue. And um, it is a non-stop cycle of a offender committing the crime, being arrested, convicted, sentenced, and then released. And once they're released, they are returned to their poor neighborhoods that they grew up in with a lot of crime. And this will lead to ex-prisoners to recommit the crimes due to the lack of guidance, support, help, advice that they need in order to succeed. So the transition from prison back into society is extremely difficult. And ex-prisoners see that they've had a shelter over their head, a roof over their head. They had shelter, food, and water while they were in prison. And once they are out of prison, they have none of that. So they will tend to recommit the crime just to have a roof over their head and be supported and know that they will be fed every day. Nothing new. So racial bias has always been the face of the criminal justice system. People of color have always been disproportionately represented in jails and prisons. Um, criminals are never seen as full citizens, and that dates back to ancient Greece, as mentioned in the article. Criminals released into society are seen as less than regular citizens and are not given the same opportunities to succeed. Again, they are stripped away from their human rights, and they have difficult difficulties living a normal life because of their record. So people of color take up the majority of drug-related crimes due to the war on drugs because the police are targeting these poor communities with people of color in them. Whites are less likely to be arrested for drug-related crimes. If they are arrested, they tend to get an easier sentence compared to people of color. At state level, black people are 6.5 times more likely to be incarcerated due to drug-related offenses compared to whites. And since mass incarceration has been happening for so long, people tend to turn a blind eye on the issue and see it as normal since it's not directly affecting them. But um, in order to solve the issue of mass incarceration, everybody needs to recognize it as a real issue that's happening every single day across the country to fix the issue. Mapping the Parallels, 
The United States has always had groups characterized or locked out of mainstream white society by law based off of race. The reason behind this changes as time goes on, adapting to different social, political, and economic contexts. The current caste system greatly resembles the Jim Crow of the past, giving those who step back and look at the facts a very familiar sense of deja vu. So both Jim Crow and mass incarceration have a lot of similarities. For instance, they were both born from white elites who were willing to exploit resentments and vulnerabilities and racial biases of the poor and working class whites to have economic gain. <clears throat> there were very few economic reforms to address the issues with working poor working class whites. So they decided to crack down on racially defined, those who are racially defined as others. And um, politicians from both of these eras would compete. So in the very early years of Jim Crow, conservatives would compete with one another to see who could pass the most oppressive Jim Crow legislation. And later on, with mass incarceration and the drug war, they also competed with each other to see who could be tougher on crime. <clears throat> so another um, similarity between Jim Crow and mass incarceration is legal discrimination and political disenfranchisement. So first we're gonna focus on legal discrimination where um, felons, felons, like if African Americans are brand, African Americans, excuse me, are branded a felon, by the time they reach the age of 21, they are subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> And once a prisoner is released, they do enter a universe that is much like the Jim Crow situation in which discrimination politically, socially, and economically is perfectly legal. With political disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement, excuse me, during the Jim Crow era, uh, poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses would be imposed in order to deny African Americans the right to vote. Therefore, they didn't get to use their voice, which was a direct violation of the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution. During the Jim Crow era, juries would be made up of all white jurors, especially when a black defendant was being tried. Um, this was made illegal in 1985 when the court ruled in Batson versus Ten Kentucky that racially biased strikes violate equal protection clause, which is stated in the 14th Amendment. Today, although discriminating someone from being in a jury based off of race is legal, the court does make exceptions. <clears throat> the court toler tolerates exclusion of people of color from juries by allowing lo lower courts to accept silly or made up reasons for excluding black jurors. Large, percentage, large percentages of black men are excluded because they are labeled as felons, which links back to legal discrimination. <clears throat> Another similarity between Jim Crow and mass incarceration is closing the courthouse doors, <clears throat> which means that the parallels between Jim Crow and mass incarceration go all the way up to the, to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> McCleskey versus Kemp <clears throat> serve as much as function as Dred Scott versus Sanford and Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson. <clears throat> Mass incarceration is now off limits and challenges of racial bias at every stage of the criminal process. New racial caste system operates unimpeded by the 14th Amendment. Supreme Court proclamation in 1857 stated the black man has not has not rights which the white man is bound to respect and unfortunately this remains true today so long as a black man is labeled a felon <clears throat> so racial racial segregation was a huge part of jim crow and it does continue today in the prison system.
Incarceration is a more extreme form of physical and residential segregation than Jim Crow, because instead of living in a different part of town, mass incarceration locks Black people away from mainstream society. Segregation is also created by the releasing of prisoners back into mainstream society, which they are immediately shunted into ghettos or generally segregated communities. This is Lila Robinson, and the chapter I read was called The Limits of the Analogy. The chapter mainly focuses on the differences between mass incarceration and the Jim Crow laws. The drug war is highlighted as a main connection between the two. A point that stood out to me was how laws prohibiting the use and sale of drugs are facially race neutral, but they're enforced in a highly discriminatory fashion. The decision to wage the drug war primarily in black and brown communities rather than white ones and to target African Americans but not whites on freeways and train stations has had precisely the same effect as the literacy and poll taxes of an earlier era. I thought this was important because it's true and highlights the connection between inequalities black and brown people faced many years ago as well as in recent times. Mass incarceration, like Jim Crow, was born of racial opportunism, an effort by white elites to exploit the racial hostilities, resentments, and insecurities of poor and working class whites. The white elites could be considered as politicians supporting harsh drug laws and law enforcement enforcing them who are biased against African Americans. Despite the fact that this chapter has explained the differences between mass incarceration and Jim Crow laws, there's an undeniable connection between the two. A distrust between these black and brown communities and the government is caused by the racial biases within those in power. This distrust has stemmed from so many issues, one definitely being the Jim Crow laws that were put in place to jeopardize African Americans' opportunity to exercise their rights to vote. The biases were proven during the drug war and even in recent times where African Americans are being charged with long sentences for minor drug-related crimes, while whites committing the same crimes are charged with much smaller sentences. Jobs vanished in predominantly African American areas, causing unemployment rates to increase exponentially. As our nation transitioned to a service economy, urban factories shut down, trapping African Americans in jobless inner cities desperate for work. A new anti-poverty campaign, including stimulus packages, education, job training, and relocation assistance could have been launched. Instead of implementing compassion and concern within these communities, we declared a war on drugs. The new system does not seek to benefit unfairly from African-American labor, but rather sees African-Americans as largely irrelevant and unnecessary to the newly constructed economy, which isn't driven by unskilled labor. Construction interventions would have been, would have benefited not only African-Americans trapped in ghettos, but also blue collar workers <laughs> of all colors, many of whom were also suffering. Clearly, African Americans and poor people of all races could be given much better set of options.